Okay, so I think we can start. So just to have a small recap of Tuesday, we talked about the grammar of graphics or the topic of statistical visualization in general and how you can declaratively describe your statistical visualizations using the grammar of graphics or libraries that implement the grammar of graphics and we looked at some examples that are available in Python that do that and we looked at ggplot in a lot of detail, so the Python version of ggplot which is called plot9 and we looked at how you can compose very complex plots out of simple statements, how you can visualize single distributions and then how you can visualize the combination of distributions and categorical variables. And then, yeah, how you can visualize the relation of two continuous variables, what problems can arise like overplotting, how to avoid them, for example, by using density, two-dimensional densities, or by using count plots, then we looked of possibilities of doing regression on those data very simply. And then we looked at the opportunities for users for displaying more than two variables in a single plot by using, uh, by combining different aesthetics, so by mapping variables to color or to size or to shape, for example. So we can have a lot of information in a single plot. And then finally, we looked at the technique of faceting that allows us to uh, split our plot by categorical variables and thus uh, compare different categories very easily and combine even more variables in single plots. So, and we ended up with this plot where we have like eight variables in a single plot and just using uh, this bit of code. So we see that the grammar is very expressive when we want to combine a lot of information in a single plot that was ggplot, then we also looked at c1, that takes a bit of a different approach that has more named functions that uh, have a lot of great defaults and look very nice also by default, but sometimes have their limitations if you want to do very complex stuff and are not as composable as ggplot. So and we left off somewhere here where we said, okay, we can do violent plots, so basically the same that we did for ggplot. And then here with uh, the joint plot where you say, okay, this is now a figure level function. You say, okay, I have two joint variables that are some I want to display. And then I have a keyword argument of how I want to do this using either hex bins or uh, regression or density or whatever. And uh, just for the contrast, there is also like a corresponding uh, axis level function that is called LM plot where you say, okay, I have two variables and then I just draw a linear regression that so again LM stands for linear model and here we can also see that faceting is also supported in Seaborn um, but it is supported directly as an aesthetic so you have so to say the aesthetic col and row for mapping categorical variables to either columns or rows so if you just pass this here we see that we get the same plot split on the categorical variable here of our cast data set of the origin of the cars. And you, we can also do more complex faceting or more granular faceting in Seaborn. So maybe to show this, I should ex really execute some code here. Mm, which leads me to the impression that I don't have a kernel. Not so very helpful. Then there it is. Ah, or like this, let's see. Yeah, it looks good. Thank you. <laughs> so, um, yeah. Yeah, much better. So we see, okay, and these plots still work. go down here, okay, this also works. This gives us this faceting. And then maybe Okay. 
Yeah, so we had this joint block. Here we have this. This works for faceting. So now, uh, if we want to make more complex facets, we have to use facet grid. So facet grid is where you just you instantiate this grid and you pass the data set and you already map. You have a few variables, so usually row and columns, and then this facet grid object exposes a function called map. So map is a function that is like common in functional programming where you don't have for loops, but instead you say, okay, I have some kind of iterable and now I want to I want to apply a certain function to all the elements in an iterable, so to all elements in a list, for example. So the way you can think of it here is, okay, we make a facet grid. We have a row and column map to, to variables. So we have a bunch of plots that we expect. And now for each of those plots, we want to apply a special plotting function. And so as a first argument, we pass then a plotting function that in this case comes from matplotlib. So we just say, okay, for each of those combination of row and column, uh, draw a scatter plot between the variables horsepower and weight in this case. So the other arguments that you pass to map will then be passed to this function implicitly. And then in the end we say, okay, we want to add a legend. And then we find out that we did not import matplotlib. Again, we see this takes some time, but then we get a plot that is comparable for to what we did with ggplot. So, for each um, yeah, for each year and for each cylinder, we get now a plot where we scatter the data. So, in theory, it should be possible to pass other point other plotting functions here as well. Um, so, for example, I think if we just pass, for example, plot. Let's try this. Don't know the guarantee that this works. Yeah, and then we see that instead of a scatter plot now, really a line is drawn through all the points. So in theory, you can use different um, plotting functions here for matplotlib. So what we could also try out is maybe use a histogram. I'm not totally sure if this will work. So if you have a histogram, we should only have like a single uh, variable. But yeah, apparently this also works. So you can try to pass different plotting functions either from matplotlib or seaborn that just draw something on an axis, and then you will re you'll see the effect of this plotting function be reflected for each of the combinations that you generated by mapping here variables to different rows and columns. Yeah. Okay. So let's come to the yeah, to an exercise again. So in the when we left off, like in the last exercise, we did some, let's see where it is. I'm actually wondering where it is, because it should be somewhere here. Um, yeah, anyway, so we had this Barley data set where we tried out different uh, combinations, or we like people tried out how to grow barley in different conditions on different sites in different years. And the plot looked OK. Um, or maybe it's actually the first time, yeah. OK, so what we're now going to do here is to draw draw the plot. And the idea is to have make a violin plot for each variety, so each different variety of barley, and then split the box plot by the color for the two years. So the experiment was done for two years. And I showed you, that's what I wanted to show you this kind of plot. Let's see. Yeah, where we have this violin plot that is split in the middle for the different um, things, but for some reason, oh, yeah, that's maybe. Okay, I should really start to execute stuff from the top again, so <laughs> I don't have all these missing imports here. Um, yeah, but the idea is to have a violin plot, but that is split in the middle for the two different years. So try out if you can achieve this 
using Seaborn and then, yeah, I'll get back to you in five minutes, I would say. This might be actually my fault because I pushed some stuff to Binder, but then I um, didn't uh, started it for the first time. So, I mean, when you push new changes, Binder will rebuild the container, and this will take some time. So, there's, I think, just a possibility to wait, but we can also take some more time now if this, yeah, I think it should take around like five minutes maybe. I need to, after you fix yours. Okay, 15? 15. Okay, hmm. and maybe the build is taking also longer right now because we add more and more packages <laughs> at some point. Might take a bit too long, but. Uh, yeah, so I'm sorry for that. I should have um, started this earlier. But um, otherwise, we can also just like uh, look at the solution together. So, um, yeah, so the idea would be that you do a violin plot. Well, no surprise if you want to get a violin plot. Then you map the variables as expected. And then you say, okay, the color should be the years or the hue should be the year. And then you say split true. So you also did find out that I did not load this data set again. Do with this is not working as expected, so. Okay, this is also not good, so then you might just go one um, step back and try to click at it again, I will also try to load it, but let's see. So it seems like the build is still going on, maybe, yeah, okay. Ah, so we are already at step uh, 74. Seven, so <laughs> yeah, so it should take maybe five more minutes. Let's see.
Yeah, but if you have this fail to uh, fail to connect, then it just like took too long, and Binder said, okay, at some point, I don't care if it's still building, I just stop now. But you can just click on it again, and you should be should get there eventually, at least. Okay, but yeah, let's look at the solution. So that would look like this. So we get a violin plot for each uh, variety. And we see the yield here, and we see, okay, how did, does the yield vary between the different years? So, and yeah, this is not totally clear to interpret. Maybe one could say that the yield in the year 1932 was a bit less for some at least, but maybe the difference is also not uh, very great. I don't know. We can maybe try to find out next week when we talk about statistical testing if there really is a difference between the year. It's also a good idea for making some exercise. Okay, so let's just continue with uh, the next topic and I hope that Binder is then by then ready for everybody again. So as I said, so both packages like Plot9 and Seaborn, they both build in the background on Matplotlib. So while they provide a very nice high-level interface, uh, down below it is just like still Matplotlib that you all know and that is used to create the plots. So, uh, so this kind of also shows us how flexible Matplotlib is that you can build like completely new libraries on top of it that don't really resemble it, but still you can do all the plotting with it. However, the advantage of this thing is that uh, as this is still matplotlib down below, you can still get to uh, the matplotlib figures and axes that uh, are those plots actually, and then just use your matplotlib knowledge to do like really tricky customizations if you need to. So if the high-level libraries don't supply you the primitives that you need to do like maybe some very uh, strange stuff where you want to highlight something that you couldn't do, then you can still go back to matplotlib. So then the question is, how do we access the matplotlib down below these libraries? So we start with Seaborn, where it is actually very easy. And we see, okay, if we call just a axis level function like this plot, where we just pass like a series there, and we get the return value, so we do not throw it away, but we capture it in a variable, and then we print the type of it, and we will see that this is actually a matplotlib axis object. So what you would usually use when you plot with matplotlib, this is just the same object that you get back here. So what you can do then afterwards is just say, okay, um, I use the usual function that I can call on the axis, so for example set, and I can set a title uh, on top of this, so I don't need to learn these details how to do them in the API. So there's an alternative way, which I would actually prefer a bit, where you say, okay, you can also pass an axis object to these axis level functions. So you can just say, okay, I create the axis myself in matplotlib, then I pass this to the plotting function from Seaborn, and Seaborn will just draw on this axis, and then I continue to do with the axis whatever I want to do. So we just use the subplot functions to get a figure, and in this case, a single axis here. And then we just say, okay, plot on it and say x equals x, and then we can again on the axis do anything that we uh, could do before. So right, we could also, what else could be set, like maybe the x label. Um, so if we wanted to keep this shorter, it should also work right. So this is in an easy way to use, get the best of both worlds, use the high-level plotting functions from Seaborn, but still get the ability to do low-level customizations with uh, Matplotlib. So meanwhile, let's take a look here. Five of five, well, <laughs> <laughs> let's see. Okay, so the same thing is possible to a certain extent with ggplot. So uh, it is not directly accessible uh, as in Seaborn, so it does not return a figure by default, but uh, so when you create the ggplot object, let's maybe do this first. So if you just have normal ggplot code like this and you 
also find out that you did not import this. Why didn't I do this? So you get the normal histogram, and what you could also do uh, on this on this whole expression, this also evaluates to an object, to a ggplot object, and this has a method called draw. So you can just call this draw method, and let me see, okay, the plot is suddenly here twice. Why is that? Because the return value of the draw method is now actually a matplotlib figure, and what uh, IPython will do by default is it will, on the first time when the figure is created, it will uh, display this figure, and then we return this figure also from the cell, so it is rendered as a plot twice. Okay, but knowing this, this gives us the ability to capture this in a variable again. So then this is not returned, or it's not like the last statement in the cell, and it's only drawn once. And we can look at the type, and we see, okay, it is a matplotlib figure, in fact. And then this, then we need to know a bit more about the matplotlib API. But figures have an attribute called axes, which is a list of all the axes that are associated with the figure. So we can just say, okay, give me uh, the first axes. Actually, I think, I'm not sure if ggplot will even generate more than one axis. But if we just have a single plot, there's definitely just one. And then we have our axis object, and then we can do the stuff that we want on it. So we could set the title, for example, and then uh, put, yeah, put, for example, also a distribution title on top of it. So to do this a bit more conveniently, you could achieve the same thing just with chaining the different methods and attribute calls. So you could say draw dot axis zero as this returns a figure now, and then you can have the axis, and then you can call set on it. So this would be possible. So next, we would again have an exercise, but. Okay, um, let's see. So let's maybe first talk about the further readings and see if we can, I mean like the lecture's over afterwards anyway, so we can, uh, I can first introduce the homework then and you can do this exercise in class. So yeah, we have some further readings as usual. We have some talk by Derek van der Plaas who talks about the Python visualization landscape and if you watch this talk, you will find out that there's not only just like the packages I showed you, but like tenfold more. So uh, there is an definitely probably more visualization package than you could ever need or be able to use, but you can watch it like for an overview and maybe you find uh, something that has a special use case. And then there's also some tutorial from uh, PyData that talks about how to use uh, also pandas and seaborn for exploratory data analysis. So it uh, goes a bit more on the details of what is what are good ideas to do when you do exploratory data analysis. So when you get a data set for the first time and need to build an understanding of what is in there in the data. Yeah, so let's, with this I would say, um, I would, I was asked to show the solutions for uh, the current homework as well. So, make this a bit bigger. Yeah, so the current homework was about experiment and uh, designing a Sternberg task experiment that uh, tries to investigate how our memory is organized. Um, so, everything was provided except this make design function where you had to create the experimental design. And so, just to recap, the idea was okay, you are shown a sequence of numbers. So between one or six, and like the numbers come from uh, between one and nine, and you are shown those numbers, and then you are shown like after some pause another number, and you ask, okay, was this number there in the sequence? And the idea is, okay, if with longer sequences, it takes more time to remember this number, then probably our memory recall is sequential, but if it is like uh, constant time or so, then probably our memory calls, uh, recall is more parallel. However, so then the idea was to make, okay, three different blocks of experiments. So first a practice block where the subject gets used to the task, and then the first block and the second block. And now you just needed to configure all those blocks. And so what how we saw to see, okay, we said, okay, these are the numbers that we want to display. So range one to 10 gives us all numbers between one and nine because 
uh, the last value is exclusive and you say okay for each block name in those blocks we make a new block then we say okay we want to show between one and six numbers so we go over range one to seven then we have two different cases either the number is apparent or so is present in the sequence that was shown before or is not present so we can iterate over true or false and then for each of those combinations you should make five different trials so we just say okay for in range five and we don't care about the return value because it's just to do this like five times here and then we make a new trial for each of those combinations we set our factors so okay this is uh, the length of like how many numbers are shown this is whether a number does appear or not and then we sample some numbers from our selection here so we have those numbers between one and nine and we sample length numbers from the selection so this you can do by random.sample you pass a collection and you pass uh, an, an, in, an integer of how many samples you want to have from this collection and you get back like a list of uh, sampled from this list here and then you can say okay for each of those numbers make a new stimuli where you say okay we do this as a text line here and then we add the stimulus to the trial so this means that we show this number as a text this would be the text stimulus then we say okay if the number does appear then we have uh, then we could so okay next up we want to now show a number so afterwards we showed the sequence of showed the sequence of numbers we want to show another number and we want to say okay either this number is from the numbers shown before or not so and we say okay if we are in a case where the number should appear we choose this from the numbers that we showed before or else we choose this from the set of numbers that uh, were not shown before so we do this by looking at all the numbers that we could possibly show and uh, take the difference of the set of the numbers that we showed and we convert this back to a list because otherwise we can't really sample from it um, because sampling I think is also hash based or something whatever um, so and the next up okay we add this final stimulus where we say okay we'll make a text line where we sample randomly from the possible numbers only one then take the first one because this returns a list and then we set the color to red I'm not sure if this was required in the design or it's just to yeah differentiate this from the number shown before then we also add this stimulus and then we add the whole trial to the block and then finally we shuffle all trials uh, in the block so that would be it except that uh, the first practice trial or the first practice block should not be as big as the actual blocks so now we have like for each usual block we have 60 different trials but we don't want to have 60 trials for practice so we somehow need to get rid of the <coughs> redundant or like the trials that we added too much and so this is like a very, you could say, Pythonic way of doing it, or maybe it's also a bit uh, sneaky, but so what we did here is, okay, now if the block is now practice, then we say, okay, we try while, so basically forever, we try to remove the 13th element from the trials. So, and we do this as long as we get an index error. So, and you can see, okay, if you have 60 things and you always remove the 13th element, this will shrink down until you have only 12 say okay we're done and then we add the block to the experiment and this is uh, it to configure the design so are there any questions regarding um, this design uh, sorry because I received an email at least that some people had problems with it So this again, hmm. why is this happening again? Okay, um, yeah. So with this, I would just uh, show you again the current homework, which is about ggplot, which is here. Yeah, so again, as I said, you might want to install this uh, matplotlib testing version that has like its own font renderer if you didn't do so already. Um, yeah, I recommend now to do this maybe in a different environment that we call SciPlot so we do not mess up our current environment. However, even if you don't do this, uh, it might be just fine because uh, I think it is much easier to solve now than the Matplotlib homework because we just need to figure out the right language, so to say, or the right words to describe the plot in the grammar. 
So on the data set will be the, or is the iris data set. This is like one of the standard data sets in statistics or machine learning. So we have three different uh, iris species. So some biologists went out and collected data on these flowers so and uh, measured the four different features. So uh, these are like petal and sepal length. So these are like how long the leaves are of the, of the flower actually. And all those things were measured here. And the idea is now, I mean, the idea is finally to somehow separate the different species or to recognize the species by those features. But for now, we just want to visualize the data and see if it would actually be possible to separate them by those features or if they just all have the same uh, sepal length or sepal width. So the idea is to make a violin plot for each species and the petal length where you say, okay, make a violin plot, jitter the data on top and also make one of those small uh, summary statistics here that gives you the mean and the standard deviation. Then make a regression plot for each species where you look at the relation between petal width and sepal width, if they are related somehow. Then make a scatter plot again for petal width against petal length. Um, but now make a facet plot, so facet the plot by the species and then also add the sepal width as a color aesthetic in there. And then the final plot is, uh, so those are all like done with plot nine, but this should be done with seaborn where you make a density plot again. Now this is now sepal width against petal width. How do these two things vary along each other? And you make a density plot and you make this uh, two dimensional density and on the margins, you want to have the cumulative density of those things. So for this, you might need to take a look at the arguments of, uh, yeah, of the density plot function and how you can customize uh, your own plot using this. Okay, so with this I would say you can get started now if you want to. I'll be here to help and maybe once Binder has finished we can also take a look. Oh, it's, yeah, it is pushing the image or there might <laughs> soon be something. We can also take a look at um, the final interactive exercise from the lecture.